Okay, so this is going to be a little bit of a recap. It's a slightly awkward talk. So I've talked on um, this topic at the last two meetups. So I'm going to start with a brief recap of MC HAP, which is the tool we've developed, um, what it does in broad strokes. And then I'm going to give some brief updates on what's, what's been improved in it since the last meeting. And then I'm going to go into a more advanced topic, which is around strategies for assembling microhaplotypes and calling microhaplotypes in families. So this is probably not the best introductory talk to MC HAP. If you're new to the topic, there is the recording from last year, which would be a better, but hopefully we'll bring people up to speed. So MC HAP is a tool for microhaplotypes assembly and genotype calling polyploids. Now, there's a few haplotype approaches over there. One of them we just heard about is polyhaplotyper. MC HAP is really focused on assembling haplotypes from sequencing data rather than from a SNP matrix. So that's a point of difference there. Um, the process itself uses Markov chain Monte Carlo, which is where the MC comes from. I will give a very brief outline of that shortly. Um, the important thing of that is that we're estimating posterior distributions for each possible genotype. So we actually get quite a lot of information about the robustness of the genotype calls that we're reporting. The tool itself is really a collection of tools. The two primary tools are MC Hub Assemble and MC Hub Call. So MC Hub Assemble is for de novo assembly from sequencing data. MC Hack Call is for calling genotypes from non microhaplotypes. And this is a tool that might be use useful if you're in a situation where you have a database of dark tag haplotypes and you just want to call genotype from them. Um, and the tool is really focused on using standard bioinformatic formats where possible, particularly VCF. It's freely available under the MIT license, and the source code is on GitHub. So this is the kind of data that I work with regularly. This is capture sequencing data aligned to a reference genome. So each of those gray bars there indicates this um, in short read or short pair of reads. The gray indicates that it matches the reference genome, and then those colored dots indicate variance with respect to the reference genome, so SNPs. If we zoom in on that, and this is an auto tetraploid individual, um, we see these repeated patterns across different reads. This is evidence of the un underlying haplotypes present in the organism. So we can see that pattern, red, yellow, blue, or just a single red, and there's also what appears to be the reference allele there. That's telling us information about the underlying chromosomal copies in that organism, but we can also see that there's other reads here that have variants that aren't present on any of the other reads, and that's sequencing error is the likely explanation there. So essentially we have a good signal of the underlying haplotypes, but we also have noise that we need to avoid. MC HAP uses this Michael Chain Monte Carlo process to try and assess those fragmented sequences that may not be completely overlapping or partially overlapping. They may have gaps and produce genotype calling or a genotype posterior distribution from that. So the MCMC process starts by proposing an initial genotype. Um, this can be a random choice, but we try and do something slightly more informed than that in practice. And then at each step in the operation and in the simulation, it proposes a new genotype based on the previous genotype and then accepts or rejects that proposal in such a way that the long-term behavior of the simulation is to approximate the posterior distribution. So essentially you produce this long chain of genotypes and the proportion of that chain that is made up of any one particular genotype is an approximation of the posterior support for that genotype. This is a short segment of the output of MC HAPS, which is standard VCF format. Those of you familiar with VCF, this will look quite normal. The big difference here is that we have these around 120 base pair haplotypes as the reference and alternative elements. So using standard VCF, albeit with these micro -hap markers in place of standard SNPs or small indels. We can see that these are also tetraploid genotypes in this case, and we have two alternate alleles. So we see genotypes that are zero for the reference allele or one or two for the two alternate alleles. So since the last time I gave this talk, the MC has um, been updated a couple of times to version 0 0.9.1. Um, there's quite a lot of just sort of housekeeping and bug fixes in there, but the, the bigger advances, we've got a new tool in there called Find SNPs. This is a way of identifying putative SNPs without actually calling genotypes to inform your haplotype assembly. This is a step that originally had to be done using an external variant caller like Freebase or GATK. Now we can just identify those um, putative basis SNPs in a very simplistic way. Um, it's optional, but it speeds things up quite a bit. We also have a new feature, which is flexible specification of sample pools. This is for a pooled assembly that I'll get into shortly. And we also improved performance quite substantially with Chrome files. So originally when I built this tool, I was working primarily with BAM files. When I moved to Chrome files, I had some performance issues. 
So that's been taken care of now. And there's a number of other small fixes and improvements there. So onto the meat of the talk, which is micro haplotyping in families. Um, MC HAP was originally designed to solve the individual haplotyping problem. So it was designed for calling genotypes in an individual without any respect to a population structure or anything like that. With the inclusion of the ability to specify more informative priors using allele frequencies and inbreeding coefficients, we were able to incorporate some of that population information in the form of a prior, but it still was fundamentally calling genotypes at an individual level. And so we wanted to explore incorporating more and more pedigree information where possible or other structured information to this genotyping process. And this is an example of a subset of a real pedigree. So in this case, um, each of those ellipses there indicates a parental sample and those diamonds indicate a large collection of progeny from that cross. The colors there indicate sequenced or unsequenced samples, so the gray indicates unsequenced parental individuals. So we can see that this is the kind of situation we often have where we have a bunch of related crosses coming from a complex pedigree, and we have no data available for some of the parents. We have data available for other parents. So this is the sort of situation that I want our tool to work in. And we should be able to exploit that structure to improve on the genotyping that we're doing with these different groups. So the three sort of main aims of incorporating more pedigree information is around the removal of noise alleles. This is a bit of an issue with MC hat when you have low sequencing depth is that because it is sampling from a prior, if you don't have much information about that individual, you get closer and closer to a random sample of the prior, which produces a lot of noisy alleles that are very, a very low probability. That's not necessarily a problem from a statistical point of view, but it's very annoying when you're working with a bloated BCF file with lots of these low probability alleles. Um, dosage accuracy is another one, which is shown in that diagram there. So we see two separate pedigrees or trios. Um, on the left-hand side, the parents in both cases have the same genotypes, but on the left-hand side, the progeny has the genotype 0223 and on the right, it's 0233. Oftentimes, these will have very similar posterior support at an individual level because they contain the same alleles, just in different dosage. But based on that pedigree information, I would say that the one on the left is much more likely because allele three is present in only one copy and one parent. And so this is how pedigree information can potentially improve dosage calling, which is a one of the more difficult aspects of genotype calling in polymoids. Um, and imputation of unsequenced genotypes is an added bonus that I'll get into later. So if we have really good pedigree context around an individual, say we have a parent and we have samples of its progeny and other individuals related to it, we may actually get a reasonable, um, reasonable, um, reasonably confident imputation of what that genotype could be or should be. So I'm going to cover sort of two topics here. This is ind indirect use of the pedigree. This is um, the same strategy as we're using in the past, where we're using the pedigree to try and generate more informative priors rather than incorporating directly. And then I'll move on to using the pedigree directly in the calling process. So using the pedigree information indirectly, basically this comes down to pooling of individuals from the same cross. The idea here is that progeny from a single cross should share the same alleles. So if you're crossing two tetraploid parents, then all the progeny from that cross should share the same alleles as the parents. That means the maximum number of alleles present there is eight. And assuming not too much selection or not too much bias and inheritance, those alleles should be roughly in proportion to their dosage in the original parents. So essentially what we're doing here is treating a tetraploid cross as a pseudo-octoploid individual with very high sequencing value. That's the idea. Now, there are some potential issues with this. One is that assumption of random inheritance. So if we do have some selection on bias and inheritance happening there, then that can cause issues. In practice, that's going to have to be a reasonably high deviation in inheritance patterns to cause significant issues in terms of generating a population prior. Um, the other issue here is that we may have mislabeled samples or an incorrect pedigree, and assuming that's only a small subset of the samples, they could be hidden by this process. So effectively, if you have some individuals that have alleles that aren't present in any of the other individuals, while well, putting them all into the same pool may mask those uniquely. So you want to be reasonably confident about your pedigree data if you're going to try this. Um, the second pedigree, using the pedigree information directly, is basically treating the pedigree structure as a Bayesian network. So the idea here is that information in the parent genotypes tells you something about what the progeny genotypes are likely to be, and the inverse is also true. So if you have a large number of progeny, the haplotypes present and the frequencies of those haplotypes present in the progeny should tell you something about the parental samples as well. And so you have this kind of bi-directional sharing of information throughout the pedigree. 
the issues here is that there's actually quite a bit of literature around genotyping using Bayesian networks, and it's notoriously difficult. Um, you get you can run into all sorts of mixing issues if you try to apply this in a restrictive sense where you're forcing genotypes to stay conformed to the pedigree structure. There's also questions about what is the pedigree, what happens if the pedigree is incorrect. So again, you want to be reasonably confident about your pedigree information. And there's also potentially issues with misbehaving loci. So one that we run into is sort of putative copy number variation is how I describe it. So if you're forcing your genotypes to conform to this pedigree structure, but the underlying, um, this is actually multiple loci appearing as a single locus, then the inheritance patterns aren't going to make sense. The number of alleles present aren't going to make sense, and that can make your problems worse. That's also an issue if you're not using a pedigree structure, but it gets worse. The solution we've come up with is what I refer to as pedigree annealing. Um, for people familiar with the Bayesian literature, that is very much inspired by the idea of simulated annealing. Essentially, the idea here is that we are taking a mixture prior of sorts. So we are starting with a prior that doesn't include any pedigree information, just allele frequencies for the population. We are assembling, um, we are calling genotypes of that, and over time during the burn-in period of the market chain, we're slowly introducing that pedigree prior. The idea here is essentially that the sequence of data alone should be sufficient to get us most of the way to correct genotypes, and we're just gradually introducing that pedigree structure into the process to try and polish those genotypes to improve dosage and squash out a few noise alleles here and there. So I was going to jump to an example tutorial now. I'm not quite sure how I'll do that. Um, that, no, I need that on the other screen. Can I drag that? Yep, that's fine. Yeah. Okay, so this is a Jupyter notebook. Um, for simplicity, sharing off a single computer, I've just generated this as to an HTML file rather than running the notebook live. Um, it's also a bit less scarier than doing a live demonstration. Um, so this is using the same example data that was already available in the repository for MC HAP. So there is an existing notebook up there that shows sort of an introductory tutorial, which I worked through in the computational session in December and also at the last um, meeting. This is using the same data, but it's changing things to use um, more of a pedigree informed focus. So in this example, I'll be working um, using MC HAP assemble to do a pooled assembly. I'll use MC HAP call to do individual based calling of genotypes. And then I'm going to use this new tool, MC HAP called pedigree for the Bayesian network approach. Now I will point out that this tool called pedigree isn't quite released yet. Um, I was hoping to have a pre-release available for this workshop, but it's an experimental tool. I'd like to do a little bit more testing first. Uh, but if anybody's interested in using it, I'm happy to um, show you how to get hold of it and have a go with it. So hopefully we'll have a release in the next couple of months. So the input files that are standardly required by MC HAP are alignment files, typically BAM, but they can also be CRAM now. Um, we have a bed file that has our target loci for assembling. We have a reference genome and we have a VCF that contains our basis SNPs for assembling. So in this VCF file, we don't actually use the sample data. We are only using the reference and alternate alleles. It's essentially just a way of using a standard format to represent that data. Now, previously, that base of um, SNFs VCF had to be generated with a variant caller. Here, we'll use the new find SNFs tool to do that instead. So inside our input directory, we have our BAM files. In this case, we have two parents, parent one and parent two, and then 20 progeny coming from that cross. So it's just a small subset. Our bed file has four columns in it, so only the first three are actually necessary, um, showing the chromosome, the start and stop locations. The fourth column is an identifier for those loci, which is quite useful because that will be reported in the output VCF file as well. So having that fourth column makes it much easier to match your inputs and your outputs together later. To identify the putative SNFs using fine SNFs, we use this syntax here. So this is a bash notebook rather than Python. The tool is written in Python, but it's a command line tool, so we're using bash to run the program. Um, so calling tool MC have find SNFs, and then we have um, specify our BAM files, our reference genome, our target intervals. So this is saying that we only want to look for putative SNFs within these low side because we're assembling certain low side. There's no need, no need to look for SNFs outside of those low side. We can then specify our thresholds for what we consider a putative SNF in terms of minor allele frequency and minor allele depth. We can do this at the population level, except what I'm doing here is doing this at the individual level, so specifying at an individual level 
I want a minor allele frequency based on allelic depths of at least 0.1 and a minor allele depth in terms of read depths of at least three. And then that third argument, the minimum number of individuals is the number of individuals that I require to con have consensus on that SNP. So this is a way of avoiding a single sample, creating a whole bunch of spurious putative SNPs from it being low quality. So you can do this at the population level, or you can specify it in the individual level and require a certain number of individuals to have consensus. This produces a VCF file like this one here. And if I scroll down, we can see that we have all of our samples there, but there's actually no genotyping information here. So this is what I mean by putative SNPs. It's producing a VCF file without genotype calls, just with allelic depths. So MCHAP doesn't actually need genotype calls here. So it's a needed computation to actually calculate some calls. Um, again, this is optional. You can use an external variant caller if you'd like to for this step. Now, with our pooled assembly, we're going to use MC Hat assembled shortly. What I'm showing here is the pooling file. So, in the last talk, I gave an example of a pool assembly for a bilayer cross, and that that was with an older version of MC Hat where you had to specify a single pool for all of the samples. Now, using this format here, you can specify multiple different pools and have a more complicated pooling strategy. In this case, because this is a simple bilayer cross, I'm just assigning all of the individuals to the same pool. So we have the simple syntax sample identifier, and then the name of the pool we want to assign it to. We then run MCHAP assemble, which is that primary tool, um, specify the BAM files, the targets for assembly, our putative SNFs that we want to use, our reference genome, and our sample pooling file. Here we're specifying the ploidy as eight because this is a pool of tetraploid individuals. So we're essentially saying, take all of the reads from all of these individuals, treat it as a single off-deployed individual, and assemble that. So if I look at the top of that VCF file, I'll skip all the metadata, which is a bit much. Um, the main thing I want to show here is that the sample list here, we can see that there's only a single sample called pool. And if we look at the actual records, the first record on that VCF file, we see that we have standard VCF format, but with a single octoploid individual. Um, in that command up here, we also specified that we want to report the AFP flag, which is the posterior allele frequency. So this is essentially a mean genotype or a form of mean genotype. Um, and we will use that downstream as part of our prior for the next step. So to perform individual genotype calling, this is M using MCHAP call. Again, we specify our BAM files. This time, instead of specifying SNFs, we're specifying the haplotypes that we want to reuse. So we're using our pooled assembly here. Um, Claudia of four in this case, because the tetraploid individuals were just guessing an inbreeding coefficient here for the sake of argument. Um, our prior allele frequency, so that specifies the flag uh, or the field in that input VCF file that we want to use for our prior. So in, we're using the posterior from our population assembly as the prior for our individual genotype calling. And then putting that into a compressed VCF file. If we look at the first example here, we have um, standard tetraploid genotype calls. So same as you would have seen in previous examples of MCHAP. I won't go into detail there. Now, if we want to do our pedigree informed calling, we also have an additional file, which is our pedigree file. This is, again, a very simple tabular format. The syntax here is the sample identifier followed by a tab, then the name of the first parent, tab, name of the second parent. If the parents are unknown, as in the case of our two parental samples, then we just use a period symbol to indicate it's an unknown. So this very simple bilelic structure, but you can imagine this can generalize to any sort of pedigree structure in theory. We then use MCHAP called pedigree, which is very similar syntax, except now we're specifying our pedigree file and also our gametic error rate. So this is where that weighting comes in and where we handle some of the uncertainty. Essentially, when we move from that prior of no pedigree information to a pedigree informed prior, we never actually get to the point of entirely relying on the pedigree information. We always assume that there's a, some chance that either something has gone wrong in terms of our pedigree records or something like that. And that's what this gametic error value is. This is effectively the target weight that we want to move to in terms of, it, it's the inverse of the weighting of the ped pedigree. I chose to refer to it as gametic error because I think that makes sense when thinking about the relationships in the pedigree. It's the error associated with each gamete that connects a parent and a child. And here I've specified a single value for all of the samples. You can break this down with a tabular file to specify different values for different individuals. So there you have one value per gamete, essentially. Um, again, we're using the prior frequencies from our pooled assembly. 
in this case, those prior frequencies only affect the non-pedigree based prior. They also affect the founding individuals that don't have parents because they ne are never their, the prior for those samples is always the same. It's always effectively the non-pedigree in terms of where their parenthood came from. So if I look at um, this output here, I get a very similar output as before. The only real difference here is that we also have this pedigree error flag here, so an additional bit of metadata. Um, this is essentially a posterior probability that the progeny genotype does not make Mendelian sense given the parental genotype. So it's a way of getting an idea if there's some sort of error going on where the pedigree structure disagrees with the sequencing evidence. This first locus, there's not much going on there because it's reasonably clean locus. The second locus I'm looking at here, locus 12, is one where I believe there's some sort of copy. There's something funny going on with this locus. I've used it as an example of a number of times of things going wrong. Um, and if we look through it here, we'll see some of those pedigree error values. There's 1.014. Others of them, like this one, are 1. And I believe that's because that individual has an allele that's not even found in the parents at all. So something strange has gone on there. Um, this metadata is referred to as the pedigree error. It doesn't necessarily mean that there's an issue with the pedigree. It could be an issue with the locus. So the best way to view this data is an aggregate. If you see a lot of different samples having issues at the same locus, that's probably a problem with that locus. If you see a lot of sample, a uh, single sample having a lot of issues across multiple loci, that's more likely an actual issue with the pedigree structure. So it's kind of, you need to put it in context to get an idea of what's happening. Um, and pedigree imputation. So here I'm running the exact same analysis, except I'm starting by generating a list of BAM files that contains, doesn't contain the first parent. So I'm just containing parent two and all of the progeny. I then run the exact same analysis, except using that um, list of BAM files that's missing the first parent. Look at the same locus. What we'll see here is we get the same samples out, except now parent one is at the back of the list. And that's because the sample has been imputed. Effectively, we've said to MC Hip that here's a pedigree. I want genotypes for all of the individuals of this pedigree, but then we've given it no information about that individual other than its position in the pedigree. And so MC Hips is effectively trying to call a genotype from no information here. So it's entirely from the prior. There's no actual observations. But because this is a very strong prior with the pedigree information, you can actually start to impute what the likely genotypes are to be for that individual. And if I look across all three of these analyses at that parent one, so the individual based calling, the pedigree informed calling, and the imputation, I get the same genotype in each case. This isn't always the case, obviously, but in this particular example it is. What I will point out here is that posterior probability in the imputation case is down to 0.52. So very low posterior probability. You wouldn't be confident in saying that's definitely the right genotype. Probably what's happening there is that there's a couple of different genotypes that could potentially explain the progeny um, given the other parent. Now if we, this is where using posterior mean allele frequencies to get a mean genotype may be a better approach if that's suitable for your downstream analysis. So I'll jump back to the real world example here. Okay, the real world example back to this pedigree I showed before. So in total, this contains just under 340 tetraploid genotypes, and we're looking at assembling 10,000 capture bait sequences. So the targets we're looking at are 120 base pairs each. Um, I'll briefly go over the strategy that I'm using here. This is basically the same strategy as I demonstrated in the notebook. I just wanted to clarify in a schematic like this. So we're originally going to use fine SNFs to generate our, um, our template VCF of SNFs that we want to use. We're then going to use the pedigree information to design our sample pools. We're going to use those that pooled assembly as a population-based prior for individual-based calling. And we're also going to do our pedigree-based calling again. So we're generating a lot of VCF files here. Um, it's just the way it is. So briefly, our polling structure here. Previously, the biallelic one is very simple, single pull for all of the samples. Here, what we're doing, first, we ignore those samples that we don't have any data for, obviously. But then what we're doing is we're taking the parent samples and putting them into each of the crosses that they were used in. So if you have one parent that's used in multiple crosses, here I'm putting that parent sample into each of those crosses. That's one option. It obviously does give a bit more weight to those parents in total. But remember, each of those genotypes here, the pseudo-octoploid genotypes, are assembled individually. So we're not actually duplicating that parental information in any one of those genotype calls. So what we've done here is we've taken our 338 tetraploid genotypes and replaced them with nine pseudo-octoploid genotypes. 
This is one of the advantages of this. So we, those octoploids have extremely high read depth, but it also means we have fewer genotypes to assemble. So we should get a speed up as well. And this is the numbers we get for this. So this is very rough numbers. This was run on a live cluster. Um, so obviously potential from interference with other jobs that are going on there. It should give a ballpark indication of the performance we have at the moment. Each of these was split into 20 sub jobs. Um, so fine SNVs, this is, the numbers for the time here is that the sum of each of those subjobs, the total wall time across all subjobs. So fine sniffs here ran in four hours. This is across the 10,000 loci. Um, the pulled assembly ran in 40 hours. If I do an individual assembly, that took around about 200 hours. So we're already getting a 5x speed up just from the pulling, which is quite nice. I honestly would have expected a bit more, but I think this is partly limited in terms of speed up because we still have all the same sequencing data in there. So it's fewer genotypes, but much more sequencing data to deal with. We also see that the memory usage there is very consistent at around one gigabyte. And this is not that intentional, but one of the nicer ways of uh, nicer sort of side effects of the way MC Hat works is we have fairly consistent and low genotype calling, which is quite nice compared to some of the other variant calling options out there. Um, to compare that pulled assembly to an individual assembly, we can look at the number of SNVs that actually varied within haplotype loci. So we used the same fugitive SNV loci for each of these analyses, but in terms of the haplotypes that were actually called, those may include different subsets of the SNFs. So some of those SNFs would have been called as homozygous for the reference at alternate alleles, depending on the assembly. In this case, we're looking only at those SNFs that weren't homozygous in all of the alleles, so they vary between the alleles. What we see here is a small difference, so the pool assembly on average gives us one fewer SNF per haplotype. It's a small difference, but it's actually quite an important one. This is where we're seeing the first evidence that we're reducing the number of those spurious noise alleles. And if we look at the actual number of unique alleles at each of these loci, we get a much bigger difference. So for the pool assembly, we're getting four to five, on average, um, unique alleles per locus, where for individual assembly, we're getting closer to seven to 10, depending on whether you're looking at the median or mean. And this in itself isn't great evidence, but if you start to actually dig down into each of these loci where you have the big difference in the number of alleles, what you'll find is that almost always at loci where there's a large number of samples with low read depth. And those are the spurious alleles you get from having little evidence to do an individual assembly. So this is two different things coming into play here. One is the fact that because we're forcing things to be octoploid, we're limiting the number of alleles that can possibly be assembled, but also having that much higher read depth means we're limiting that even further because you've got much stronger evidence for the alleles that are present in each class. So the pulled assembly is approximately five times faster. It results in fewer haplotypes, which should be a good thing in theory. Um, and it certainly speeds up downstream analysis. So the next step in the process for genotype pooling in computational terms scales with the number of haplotypes in that input V here. So not only should it be a more confined and more restrained prior, which should be a more informative prior, it's also reducing the parameter space that we have to explore, so it's speeding up the downstream analysis. So onto the next step in this process, which is the individual and pedigree informed calling. If I run those numbers there, we see that for the individual calling, it takes just under 100 hours in aggregate across the subjobs, and for the pedigree informed calling, it's closer to 500. So this is Another one of the reasons that I haven't quite released the pedigree calling tool yet, I do think we can squeeze out a bit better performance than that, but it is an inherently slow process because it's a more complex um, prior. There are some potential speed ups that we could make use of the pedigree structure to try and do some speeding up and ignoring some samples, um, and I want to play around with that as well, but these are a good idea of what the numbers are right now. Again, the memory usage is pretty consistent there. It is a little higher for the pedigree informed pooling because we need to store all the genotypes in memory at the same time. Now, this is where the story gets a little bit frustrating. Because the pooled assembly worked incredibly well, we don't actually see much difference between the um, downstream genotype calling. So between those two downstream analyses, we get over 95% congruence between the genotype calls across the 10,000 loci and 300 and something samples. Um, and even when it's incongruence, the majority of it is just in terms of the dosage rather than the actual alleles. Now, that is what we would expect, actually. That's more reasonable. But basically what we've got here is that we have a high-quality assembly, which means we're not actually getting much benefit from adding the pedigree on here. The individual calling is doing pretty well in the first place. Um, in total, we see a mean improvement 
and the posterior probability is it's a tiny fraction. Um, but that's because many of those posterior probabilities from individual calling are already close to one. If we look at just those that were lower than 0.9 in either analysis, then we get a mean improvement of about 5%. And if we look just at the incongruent calls between the two analyses, we get a mean improvement of about 4.5%. To give that in a plot, what we're looking at here is the locus mean depth um, along the x-axis. And on the y-axis, we're looking at the change in posterior probability at a single locus for the pedigree informed um, calling. So a positive value on that y-axis is showing an improvement in posterior probabilities from the pedigree informed information, and a negative value is showing a decrease. And what we're showing there is really the expected result. When the locus mean depth is the lowest, so the sequencing depth is the lowest, we get the biggest improvement in posterior probability from our more informative prior. That's the kind of thing you would expect. Um, I think the important thing here is that if you have high sequencing depths like what you have here, then you may actually not get much improvement from the pedigree information. This is something that's more, more useful when you have lower sequencing depth. So what I've done here is I've found a couple of examples with medium to lower sequencing depth. The first example has a mean depth among samples of 34. The genotype incongruence between the pedigree and non-pedigree information here was, uh, analyses here was around 10%, and only 2.5% of that was genotypes that actually differed in their allelic constitution. The others were just dosage variations. The mean posterior probabilities improved from 0.88 to 0.91, what we would expect with a more informative prior. If we look at the genotype calls here, so what I'm showing here is the genotype calls for that pedigree, and for each of those advanced crosses, I'm just showing the first 10 individuals to keep it on the page. So these are for the individually called genotypes. These are for the pedigree informed genotypes, and we're seeing there in those gray circles are the imputed parental genotypes. So I haven't got posterior probabilities attached to those, but if I did, what you would see is that those have much lower probability than the surrounding informed genotype calls. But they still look like reasonable parental genotypes. And the more weight I want to put on that pedigree prior, and the more sort of contextual information I have in the pedigree, the greater this posterior support for those genotypes would be. If I look at the difference at this locus, we can see some of those dosage variations here. Um, There's not that much change here, but if you go through each of these individual changes in dosage, you will see that on aggregate, they do look like sensible improvements. If we look at a worse locus, so here we have a mean depth of around seven. Um, the genotype incongruence between the analysis here is about 30%. The allelic incongruence, so genotypes that actually differed in terms of the unique alleles present was around 10%. And the posterior probability here improved from not good to slightly less than good. Um, so our individual calls, our pedigree calls with the imputed genotypes, and then our differences between the two. So the yellow arrows there indicate changes in dosage. The blue arrows there indicate changes in the actual set of unique alleles that were present. It's There's more work to be done here. Um, this I wanted to do a demonstration with real data. Um, the difficulty of that, of course, is you don't know the truth underneath it. So I can't say anything here other than that if you work through this data, the genotypes from the pedigree analysis certainly conform more to the pedigree structure as we would expect. So assuming the pedigree structure is correct, then those do appear to be more sensible genotypes. What we really need to evaluate here in future is some high quality simulated data, and that involves simulation of NGS sequences, which is another whole topic in itself. So anyone's got some suggestions, I'm all ears. Um, so in conclusion, pedigree structure can be utilized to improve genotyping accuracy and haplotype calling. Um, pulled haplotype assembly is a really simple approach that you can do right now. Seems to work very well. Pedigree informed genotype calling is also a promising approach that's still in the works. But in some cases, the simple approach will get you 99% of the benefit. So I would, if you're looking at a pedigree like this and you're interested in using MCHAP, I would recommend currently doing a pulled assembly followed by individual calling. It's the fastest way to do it, and it seems to give pretty good results. So in summary, um, sort of more of a summary of the tool itself. In MCHAP, we really are more and more pushing this idea of a two-step approach, where you do a de novo assembly, which is really about generating a population prior for your individual calling later on. This makes sense in related population, populations of related individuals, which most of us will be working in might be less sensible in terms of a germplasm collection or something like that but even then you would want it you would generally expect 
individuals to share more of the possible set of haplotypes than um, on average. So it may still make sense. Um, so that two-step approach is de novo assembly, generate a population prior, then individual genotype calling. At the moment, that's done with MC hat call using the population prior, hopefully soon with this pedigree-based calling as well, if you're interested. Um, just to reiterate, MC hat can handle any ploidy individual, so it can handle mixed ploidy data sets. You can specify ploidy per individual. And that has been extended to the pedigree calling. So we can, specifying some additional parameters that weren't shown there, we can handle ploidy manipulations, things like double reductions, which are points, and so on. So there's parameters available for that. That's of particular interest to us because we do have some exploited categories which are quite interesting. Um, the performance at the moment I've described is acceptable. So it's written in Python, but the performance sensitive components are written using the number JIT compiler, which is a faster compiler for a subset of Python targeted at numerical computing. Um, people say it's rough, you know, it's ballpark similar with C if you use it well. In practice, it's it's not as fast as C, but it's pretty good. It gets you a lot closer to C than plain Python does. There's still room for improvement here. So the pedigree calling, obviously, I want to try and improve a bit, but even the individual based calling, there's actually some fairly straightforward optimizations that are still to add there. So at the moment, I describe this as acceptable performance because I have access to a compute cluster. Um, I would like to get it to the point where it's reasonable to run analysis on a few hundred individuals on a standalone desktop or something like that. And I think that's, yeah, might take a couple of days, but it's doable. And so I would like to get performance to that level in the future. Um, we really emph emphasize standard bioinformatic formats and I'll encourage others to as well. It's a bit of a hassle getting used to them, but you can actually do a lot with VCF if you just play around with it and still be within the specification. It makes interoperability between programs very easy. And finally, not shown here, we can report much more posterior information, including full genotype posteriors, if you're interested in that. That makes for a huge VCF, though, so be careful. Um, way back, well, I'm way ahead of time. Yeah. Um, way back in 2022, I had this list of things I want to improve on. Um, make use of pedigree data question mark was in there. So I think I can tick that one off now, almost. Documentation has been improved. Always room for more improvement, and I do intend to do more of that in the future. Um, but the some of the other features that we promised around use of prior allele frequencies and reporting posterior allele frequencies have been implemented. This is just a very rough list I made up last night, but um, user friendliness and documentation is probably near the top of the list, if not the top of the list, in terms of what I want to work on. I do see some more room for improvement around specification of priors and then hopefully we'll get some of that work done in the Polyploids Plus um, proposal. Um, and as I said, performance. I think there's actually quite a lot of room for performance improvements here. So brief acknowledgements to this group, obviously. Um, also, PhD Works was funded by the Kiwi Fruit Royalty Investment Program, and that's where this work began. Um, I want to highlight the people that have given me feedback. Many of them are here today, even if it's just a small issue on GitHub, it's really useful to get an understanding of how people are using the tool and what they're doing with it. And occasionally some actually quite nasty bugs were reported. So thank you for that. Um, so thank you to the project members and also thank you to the other collaborators. Any questions for Tim? He has project time. Yeah. <clears throat> Do you want to talk about something else? No. <laughs> um, Sorry, I must have gone faster than I timed it. But, you know. <laughs> I hope somebody's got a very long question with a very easy answer. Um, uh, it will be a long question because I haven't thought it all the way through. Cool. Um, uh, so strawberry is mostly digitalized, so I just treat everything as a bit more interesting. Yes. Find yep. some nice examples. Go with the broad pedigree where you do have uh, triangular experience. And so obviously, if you go to an haplotype, you are going to have, you know, have a single one, you have a single yep. haplotype. If I want to do nuance with eight alleles at a site, I can't really, it's hard to do the dosage. Yes. Yeah, so this is one of the difficulties of working with multiple.
the electric data in general is that the simple dosage, often the dosage matrix or the SNP matrix, whatever you want to call it, that's a simple two-dimensional structure, you know, variance time samples, because you're just looking at the alternate the allele depth. Um, working with multi-allelic variance does mean you're effectively moving to a three-dimensional structure, either that's ploidy on the third axis or alleles on the third, third axis when you're looking at allele counts. So that's where the downstream tooling um, we're hoping to improve. I have also been involved in another project called SGKIP, which does support multi-allelic variants. It can read VCF with multi-allelic variants. It can do some analysis on them. Um, GWAS is not one of them at this point. Maybe Jeff can comment on GWAS with multi-allelic variants. He's probably got a better idea than me. Um, sorry, for the people listening, the question was about how to actually work with multi-allelic variants downstream in terms of GWAS and other analyses. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, the general consensus is that it's on the to do list. Um, so there, there are some things you can do with this, though. We saw, um, sorry, I've forgotten his name, but at the computational um, workshop, one of the bargaining members there presented on QTL analysis using multi allelic markers. Um, interested oh. to talk about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so that that's an interesting use case which I'd like to see more. Um, another one is the weird good approach. In my last talk, I gave for estimating kinship and relatedness. Um, not in the original paper, but that method does generalize quite nicely to multi allelic markers, and that can be done in SGKIP right now, which I've made use of in the past. Thank you. Any other questions? Oh, there's a question on the chat. Okay. Uh, there we go. Uh, so a question about using long reads. Um, yes, in theory. I haven't done it yet. I've had some feedback from others who have looked into it. Um, so the analysis does generate generalized to sequences of any length, you can use long reads. The, there are some parameters you may want to change depending on the long read information you're using. So there's a there's a parameter in there which is about the expected error rate in terms of base cooling and reads. That's currently set to an estimate from a paper by Tessa, Tessa et al. on short read sequences. Um, so that parameter is by default coded for short reads, the Lumina reads. You may want to play around with that. The other thing to consider, um, this analysis doesn't allow for recombination at all. So we're working with regions where we assume no recombination. That's less of a problem for individual genotype calling. If you're trying to do something pedigree informed with long reads, that could become a problem. I'm thinking about that problem at the moment. I would say with using long reads, MCHAP doesn't handle indels at all. So you're effectively getting some of a haplotype. You're basically trying to assemble a sequence of reads that, uh, a sequence of SNPs that extend along the long read, you don't necessarily need to include all of those SNPs. So if you're interested more in IBD or inheritance of haplotypes, I would recommend trying to have a sensible subset of SNPs so that the parameter space is smaller. Um, you could play around with that. If you're getting really noisy, messy results with your initial analysis, then maybe try and tune it down to a subset of SNPs. Um, so yes, it's theoretically possible at least some people have played around with it, but it's still a bit of an unknown in terms of the exact best way to tune the program for that. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So. Yes. Um, so the question is about this. MCHAP currently runs per locus, ignoring all the other loci nearby. Um, and the question is about incorporating linkage information to improve the analysis. In theory, yes. Um, obviously, a more difficult computational problem. Um, I have thought about it that in the past. I'm not sure whether it's a feasible approach to include it directly into this. Um, using long reads to link up your local loci would be one approach to doing that without actually changing the code at all. Another option would be trying to improve the local assembly and then generating 
a linkage map or something downstream from the results to correct things after the fact. Mm -hmm. Obviously, getting more done in a single analysis in theory is better. You're exploring a larger parameter space, but that's harder as well. So in short, yes, it should definitely improve things. I'm not sure the best way to do it at this point. Yeah, it, yeah, it depends on your data quality. I mean, the other thing I should say here is the capture sequencing array we're using, um, it's targeting exonic targets. KiwiFruit's quite variable, so we're just focusing on exons. Um, that does simplify it. Again, whether or not you want to include introns probably depends, uh, introns or non-coding sequence, depends on what data you have available, but also on your crop. If it's highly heterozygous, that can cause problems, um, particularly around indels and null alleles and that kind of thing. 